So where we are headed is at this point in our semester, we can solve any linear set of equations, exactly, approximately, etc. And so we're setting ourselves up the task to see where our linear techniques can take us if we try to extend them into the world of nonlinear functions. And so the, what we're really after is finding solutions to f of x equals zero. So roots are points where the function vanish, vanishes. It's a function that depends upon n variables, and there are a total of n equations. We have n nonlinear equations and un, n unknowns, and that's a pretty audacious task, okay, to try to find solutions. What we did for n equals one is we found out that we could approximate the function by near a given point by a constant value, then we had a slope, and then we had the deviation of the function about x zero. So we let x's vary in a small region about x zero. <clears throat> what we're moving towards is trying to get something similar for systems of nonlinear equations, and then we hope to replace our simple slope with a matrix. So this will be a vector in Rn, this would be a square matrix, and then this would be another vector in Rn. And if we can do that, we could get a vector version of Newton's algorithm, and it's called Newton-Raphson, and it basically says we have an estimate of the root, we want a next estimate so that we're at the root. Then we simply solve this equation for xk plus 1. And that will turn out to be possible when we can figure out what is a. And we have to check whether it's invertible or not. So that's really what we're after. And so what we did on Monday really was we're doing the case n equals 1 and here we have m variables, but only one equation. So we're just trying to get set up to understand the extension of the notion of slope, which is a derivative of a scalar function. And so what we ended up with are these things in calculus called partial derivatives. And what you're really doing is you hold one variable constant, say x2, and so now I only have a function of a single variable and I calculate its slope. And then I hold the other variable constant, so I hold x1 constant, and I vary x2 about a point, and I get its slope. So those are called partial derivatives. So it's still rise over run. We just do one variable at a time. And the fancy notation from calculus is this partial symbol. And we indicate which variable we are varying by putting it in the denominator like this. So, nice, friendly notation, very compact, and all it means is calculating the slope of a function at a point, one variable at a time, and that's the ith variable. And these give us um, different ways to do the approximation. We can do a forward difference. And so this is perturbing or modifying or varying the ith component because EI has a 1 in the i and 0 otherwise, so we're not changing x any place except the i variable, just as the notation says here. We can do a backwards by moving the h with a minus, and then we have the symmetric difference when we perturb forwards and backwards. And it's, once again, one variable at a time. And just to be painfully clear, maybe, or extra clear, if m equals 3, r equals 1, this means we're taking vectors that have three components, so we can write x as x1, x2, x3 would be the more common way to often write it, at least in high school notation. And then if we wanted the slope with respect to the second variable, that's the partial derivative with respect to x2, we're just putting variations in the second component, and this is a forward difference approximation. 
and being extra clear, this is only changing the second component if I use E2. If I use E3, I'd be changing the third component. So one component at a time gets changed. Um, in Julia, if you're doing a for loop and you want to generate these EIs, Julia has a reserved variable called I, capital I, and so you can't call your identity matrix I, you have to call it something else. I always call mine ID for identity. And you just take the zeros N comma N, and then you add I, you give no variable here, it automatically adjusts I to the size of this so that the plus sign makes sense. Why in Julia there's not an EYE of N, I don't know. Um, but you, you can make your own, right? So um, that's how you get the identity matrix in, in Julia. Okay, so what, where we left off is we're getting the linear approximation of a function at a point. And so we're trying to write f of x as a scalar, because f is real valued. Our matrix approximation was going to be then an, a 1 by m matrix times a m by 1 column vector, and we found out that a sub i was the partial derivative of f with respect to xi at the point x0. And we did that by plugging in x equals x0 plus h times ei, and we got that this was the ith component. And that's where we left off. <laughs> Questions? Too long of a review? Yeah, I often maybe do that a little overboard, but um, I believe the world is a differential equation and we always need to reset the initial conditions, okay? So someday you'll appreciate what that means. So this matrix here with components, partial derivatives has a name and it's called the gradient. So We'll just define that. Okay, so definition, and it has a really cool symbol. Definition. The gradient of a function that depends on m variables, and the function itself is real valued, the gradient of the function at a point x0 in Rm is, you've got this awesome upside down triangle symbol that is pronounced grad, I'll write that out. But gr the gradient of F at the point X0 is defined to be the row vector where you do the partial derivative with respect to the first variable the partial derivative with respect to the second variable, dot, 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 partial derivative with respect to the last variable. Okay, that gives us a one by m vector. It's a row vector. So that's the gradient. This awesome symbol is pronounced grad. And one says grad of F or simply grad F when you've got awesome symbol F. Okay, so that's how you pronounce it. How do you compute it? You do, if you 
or like me, you most often do, when it's numerical, you do a symmetric difference. Hold all the components constant except the first one, get the first component. Hold all the components constant except the second one, do a symmetric difference. Hold all the components constant except the last one. Stack those up in a vector, you've got the gradient. Okay, so that's, that's what this is, that's the gradient. Okay, so then if we summarize our linear approximation, of a function at, what does it say, x0. So we now know that it's the function at the point x0, and then we get to write it as this beautiful symbol gradient of f at x0 times the vector x minus x0, okay? Everything should be in the reals here, because f takes rm to r. Let's make sure. This is one by one. This is one by m. And this is m by one. So it all works out when you do the multiplication. It, gets, it turns out to be one by one. And just to beat the notation into the ground, once again, partial, so slope with respect to x1, slope with respect to x2, slope with respect to xm, and then this would be x1 minus x01, x2, x02, dot, 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 xm, x0m. Okay, so it, it is a linear approximation because that's a constant. These are constants when you fix x0. These are constants, and then these are the variables, and they're first order. Okay, there's no sines, there's no cosines, there's no squares anymore. They all went away. Good time for questions on partial derivatives, gradients. Going once, going twice. Well, okay, so let's compute a linear approximation then. Compute a linear approximation of f of x equals x1 times cosine of x2 at the point x0 equals 2 pi over 4. Okay, so just as a reminder, that's the example we did Monday. F of s is x1 cosine of x1, x1 times cosine of x2, and we did the point 2 and pi over 4, and then we computed the derivative here. Whoops, I hate to, when I do that. So here you fix x2 and you varied x1, so the slope was pi 1 over 4. And then here you fixed x1 at 2 and you varied x2 about pi over 4. 
and we got minus the square root of two. Okay, so we're going to use those values. So there are, they were all computed Monday. Okay, so we'd have f of x is approximately f of x zero. So the way you do these things is you write down all the symbols and then you slowly unravel them. Okay, so there's the linear approximation, grad f of x zero. And let's untangle the fancy grad into individual partial derivatives. So those are just individual forward differences or symmetric differences. And this would be x1 minus x01 and x2 minus x02. Okay, being super pedantic, writing out our form, general formula, and then all I did here was unravel the gradient and then break this vector up into its individual components. Now I'll substitute in. So for the function, x1 is 2, x2 is pi over 4. And then there's the gradient. You can plug in our estimated values if you prefer. And then this is x1 minus 2 and x2 minus pi over 4. That is a minus. There we go. Then if you want, you can do this as square root of 2 over 2 times 2, so the whole thing is square root of 2, but that's up to you. Okay, so you just write down the linear approximation. It's a row vector times a column vector plus a constant when f is real valued. Calculate each of the components of the row vector. Symmetric differences, what I use, okay. And then let's see what this looks like. Okay, so what do I have here? and all these different colors. Come on, get out of the way. So, let's, so we have f of x. I'm plotting that on the z-axis. So here's x1, x2, and then here's f of x1, f of x2 on the z-axis, okay? This curved thing, that's the true function. The red thing, that's the linear approximation. It looks really good, doesn't it? Okay, it describes the function really well near the point at which you computed the linear approximation. So it is perfect at the point two pi over four because then that's zero and that's zero and it's just the function value. So it's perfect at one point. Then the function is curving slightly away. But this is a plane, okay? So this really looks like z equals c1 x1 plus c2 x2 plus a constant, okay? So what is the constant here? Well, what's multiplying x1? Square root of 2 over 2. 
What's the constant C2? What's multiplying x2? Minus square root of 2. And then you take this vector times this vector and add this constant. That's what you get for C0, okay? So it's just a plane. So it really is a plane. Okay, that's what this linear approximation is. So this is a plane in R3. Plane in R3. Oops. Okay. Please go back. Yay. Okay. So that's what we're doing. Once you got, so if you have a good linear approximation to the function, then you can imagine that you can analyze properties of the function by, instead of calculating every exact value of the function as it curves away from the center point, approximating it by the plane, and that's what, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so that's where Newton's algorithm came from when we had a scalar function and we looked at a slope. This is similar. We're writing the function as a constant vector plus a matrix times a vector. That's the linear approximation. And we're focusing right now when the function is real valued because I can't plot beyond R3, okay? So when we have a function of six variables, and there are seven equations or something, and I get a matrix, I can't show you the linear approximation and how wonderful and awesome it is, okay? So this is as best I can do. <clears throat> and then just for fun, um, I'll insert so you can, you have it, but it's also in the book, is the code that I use to compute this stuff and plot it. So you can just look for it in the book. It'll be more clear. Um, wow, really sad about the uh, pixelization of my copied image. But um, so you can see really what I did was I have a function of two variables. And I created functions of one variable by just plugging in constants for the others. So now I have a function of x1 and x2. And then I had a little routine. Whoops. Go back wherever you were. Um, but still, slide up. OK. Whatever. Um, and then I'm just calculating slopes. Oh, I'm not calculating anything. Okay. I'm just calculating slopes. So I do a deviation about the second variable. It's a symmetric difference. And there's got to be somewhere the uh, other variable. Oh, this is my own code. No wonder it's not documented. Um, but the F1, DF1, DX2 is calculated as well, and that's what I use to generate the, the plot. Okay, so it's just simple deviations. <clears throat> okay, so now back to size. No thing in the chat, so general. Functions F takes RM to RN. And the Jacobian. OK, so what I'm giving you here is if you've had calculus, it's partly a review. If you haven't had calculus, we're just talking about generalized notions of slopes at points. Um, and then, please. 
F takes Rm to Rn means that X depends on a ton of variables, M of them, and they're all organized as a vector. M. Oh, that came out poorly, but um, maybe we can do better. I'll fix it while you're writing. Whatever. Okay, so. So these are the equivalent of us doing M by N matrices, okay? So F takes Rm to Rn. That's the nonlinear equivalent of us finally getting to M by N matrices. So we seek, once again, how in the world do we do a linear approximation of such a complex thing. So we must want to fix a point. How do we come up with the linear approximation? Because what we're going to do is we will then let M equal to N, and we'll have N equations in N unknowns. And when we have the linear approximation, we'll be able to start doing iterative approximations to solutions. Okay, so I want to write F of X is a vector in Rn plus a matrix times x minus x0. So this is now in Rn. So let's just make sure we get the sizes. So this has to be n by 1. We know x is in Rm, so this is m by 1. And so A has to be N by M. So we're really approximating it by a vector plus a matrix times another vector, where we center X about the point that we have. We evaluate the function at the point, and we're trying to figure out what is the generalized notion of slopes that goes in front of that so we have a linear approximation. Everybody can picture this now, right? We've got nine variables down here, and then we've got eight functions, let's say, here. Everybody can see the linear approximation? Absolutely not, okay? So we did the only cases that we can actually draw. That's when we have a scalar function of a scalar variable and then a scalar function of two variables, we can picture the linear approximation. This, we just have to recognize that the function is a constant vector, a vector centered about that point where x can vary, and then a constant matrix. That's what makes it a linear approximation. Okay? So our geometric intuition is gone. So we have to use our algebraic, algebraic knowledge. So I'm going to break A into its columns. Okay. N rows, M columns, and I'm going to keep this as X minus X zero. I want to do vector type calculations here and figure out what the columns have to be. Okay, so question is, how 
how should we define AI column so that we have a linear approximation to F at the point X zero. Okay. So some of you maybe can just jump ahead and see it. Some of us can't. So let's just see if we can make choices for X to unravel what these column vectors have to be. Well, the tricks we use for the gradient works really well, okay? So just as we did in the case that our function depended on a bunch of variables, but it, it was just a scalar when we did it. We're going to choose x to be of the form x0, and then we're only going to change it in the ith direction. So we're, going to, we're doing partial derivatives. That's what we're doing. OK, so if we do that, OK, so I'm going to, in this formula, I'm going to take x, how many times will I do that before the term is over? Another 25. I'm going to take x to be just changing the ith component. So what does x minus x0 look like? OK, so it's just h times ei. I'm only changing in the ith component. And then let me write eij. So that's Julia notation, OK? <laughs> we'll take the jth component and just remind ourselves this is 1 when i equals j, 0 i not equal to j. And use our sum over columns times rows definition of matrix multiplication. So let me just put down what we're multiplying. A1 column, A2 column, AM column, and we're multiplying it by the ith column of the identity matrix. Okay. So what does that equal? Well, we take the first column and we multiply it by the first row here. And we get, well, depends what i is, OK? Let's suppose i is 3. So then the first row here is 0. So we have 0 times this. If i is 3, we take the second column times the second row here. We still get 0. 
finally, let's say I is three, we look at A2 column, A3 column, and we multiply it times this, we get H times this, okay? So this equals H A I column. And it's because everything is zero, everything is zero, that's a new one, everything is zero except the ith row. So we look at the row times column, the ith row picks out the ith column, all the others give zero. Okay. So, so in other words, we have f of x is approximately f, excuse me, I already changed x, f of x0 plus h ei is approximately f of x0 plus h times ai column. And now I'm going to solve this equation. This is for real. I'm going to solve this equation for ai column. So ai column is approximately equal to f x0 plus h e i minus f of x0 over h. And have we seen that expression before? Yes, a whole bunch of times now. That's called a forward difference approximation of a partial derivative, okay? So if we let h be small, calculus calls this the partial derivative at the function at the point x, x i. The only difference is this is a whole column of partial derivatives, okay? F has a first component. We do the deviation in the ith variable. It has a second component. We're doing the deviation, etc. But you guys know and now, I think, appreciate the power of numerical computation. You don't care if this is a vector valued function. You just evaluate it at this point. You take the difference, you divide it by h, and you generate the entire column all at once, okay? There's no extra notational work for you guys. But, so let me just write it out. Um, so definition. So let f takes m variables, n equations. It's called the Jacobian. Of f at the point x0 is df by dx at x0 by definition equal to df dx1 at x0, df dx2 at x0, df dxm at x0. And how is that different than the gradient? It looks just like the gradient, okay? Well, if we look at the ith, oh, the jth entry, well, sorry, I'll write it like this, sorry. I pre your, your notes, you can't really just erase it. I understand, I apologize. 
df dxi at x0 is really a whole vector. Because f has a first component, f has a second component, f has an nth component, Okay, so this is really an N by M matrix. So when you take calculus, when you take calculus, they focus so much on doing the analytical derivatives that if you had a function of that had seven components and it depends upon five variables, you just cringe if somebody asks you to compute the actual Jacobian, okay? You'd rather crawl up into a ball and not come out of your apartment for the entire day than to take on the calculation of that Jacobian. But numerically, it's a super simple operation. As soon as you've manage to enter in what the function, so it comes to you, and you want to calculate the columns of this Jacobian matrix, you just do, here's forward differences. You guys can see immediately what the symmetric difference form of that would be, the backward difference form. And you just calculate all of these Jacobians in a heartbeat, okay? So it's a for loop. You calculate each column in a for loop, and you just don't care. That can be 50, and this can be 50. You just don't care, okay? So that's the thing. Calculus puts you in this mindset where it's all analytical calculations, but in any real engineering problem, they don't pay you the big bucks that you guys are going to earn to do rote calculation of partial derivatives by hand. You're not paid to do that, okay? <laughs> Because first of all, you'd make mistakes, and second of all, it would take you a long, 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 long time. So um, how come this is I? Okay, so you guys know how to do this uh, numerically, and you're doing it, I think, in Julia homework eight, which is cool. You're working ahead of me. What we're gonna show you in homework nine, which we don't post until a week from tomorrow, um, we're going to introduce you to symbolic Python. It's just a package we'll load up into Julia, and it will give you analytically a function, and it will just symbolically compute all of these derivatives for you, okay? Calculus has been automated. Oh, I don't have to do all these things by hand. You don't have to do them even numerically if you don't want to. You can do them... Um, you can do them using symbolic packages. Okay, so homework nine. First of all, it's short in the Julia part. It'll take you about half an hour at most, but introduces you to the whole world of symbolic mathematics. Okay. Where a computer, a computer can actually manipulate variables for you and compute derivative. Actually manipulate. Got to put in all the words. and compute derivatives. You can also do integrals. So 
Those of you who have had calculus have had the displeasure of doing changes of variables under the integral to get closed form solutions. You might know 13 different ways to do that. Well, every single one of them and much more than you've ever done is already programmed up. So all that time you spent learning to do all that was maybe fun as a game, just like playing Sudoku or a crossword, but it's not for real anymore, okay? So. Is that heartbreaking or good news? Good news <laughs> for some of you. Others, you're going like, uh, I wasted all that time. Yeah, that's how I felt when I did complex variables and realized that, yeah, it's not any good. Um, OK, so then the linear approximation of f takes rm to Rn, we just use the Jacobian at x0 is f of x is approximately, you just evaluate the function at a point, you get a big vector. You calculate this Jacobian. If you have a function, a program like SymPy, you do it analytically. If you don't, you just do symmetric differences, and life is dandy. Okay, so this is n by 1. This is n by m, m by 1. So, kind of cool. Replace complicated functions locally by an approximate linear function. We like matrices. We're trying to figure out where the matrices come from. And here it's a whole bunch of slopes. Take each component of the variable of the function, and then you take each of the variables in there and you deviate each one of them by a small amount. You calculate slopes each of those terms, so just a whole matrix of slopes. And that gives you a linear approximation. So we'll squeeze in maybe one example, and then newton raphson on Friday. First component's easy. We just multiply the variables. Second component will take log. That can be the natural log. It can be any log you want. I just don't care. And what did I put there? Cosine of x1, sorry. And then I put x2 raised to the power of x1, and then x1 times x3 over 1 plus x2 squared. OK? At the point x0, is pi 1, 2. OK, so I just wanted to put something down that would have at least curdled my freshman blood when I was a student, OK? Because <laughs> as a freshman, I came from a high school where there was no AP anything. There was sort of like the opposite of advancement, regression placement, OK? That's the kind of courses I had in, in uh, rural Oklahoma. So I was, was forced into you know, calculus as a freshman and had my mind blown, OK? And I didn't get to these vector things until, I don't know, year two, right? So um, a lot of you are ahead of that. If you're not, yes, you're with me. So we'll do the numerical calculations um, Friday, and then we'll wrap up with newton raphson OK? So, but that's no problem to do it numerically. It's just a, it's just a piece of cake. 
and no one ever let me in on the joke, okay, when I was a student. So <laughs> I'm letting you guys in on the joke. This is not hard. Thank you.